Let me uh, focus your attention this morning on Luke chapter 19, Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Luke, Luke chapter 19, we're going to be looking this morning at the first 10 verses, a famous account, Jesus and Zacchaeus. I asked Mark if we could sing the song this morning, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, but he refused. <laughs> I understand. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, actually, Luke chapter 19 beginning in verse 1, reading through verse 10. It says, He entered Jericho, Jesus did, and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, the crowd, saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And may God use this very familiar story to show us something of His amazing grace that will change us forever. This is part four of a series that I began a few weeks ago entitled Pictures of Grace. And the goal of this series has been to go back to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, go back to the Gospels and explore different events, different accounts, different episodes in the life and ministry of Jesus and hear exactly from Christ Himself about the very nature of God's amazing grace. And I've mentioned each and every week that there is nothing more difficult for us to get our hearts and our minds around than the nature of God's grace. It is deeply offensive to our most natural sensibilities. It turns everything that makes sense in our transactional and conditional world upside down, which is why I've said that if, if we don't encounter grace and conclude that can't be right, then it's not true grace that we've encountered. It's that shocking. It's that scandalous. It's that wrecking. It's that counterintuitive. And so I hope and I pray that as a result of making our way through this six-week series and looking specifically at Christ's life and ministry, we will come to a greater understanding of God's amazing grace and what that looks like in practice. So we come this week to a remarkably familiar story. As I was outlining this series and thinking about what I would look at over six weeks, because there's just so much here in the Gospels, so much that I could preach from, I went right to this story and thought, this is such a good story. It's so familiar. We often overlook the weightiness of it. But here again, what we see in this story is God's shocking grace on display. Grace does not make sense to our natural minds. And I was talking to a friend this week and I said, listen, um, oftentimes the way we think about the Christian faith is that um, we have an operating system and uh, the Christian faith is simply a new application to an old operating system. That the Christian faith is the installation of a new program on top of the old operating system. And so we try to make grace fit 
our old operating system and what the Bible comes and tells us is no, grace is the new operating system. And so the old operating system, the way that we view life and the way that we think things through has to be taken out and replaced with God's operating system. And that's why sometimes when we speak about this, it's hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to get our minds around. And we have a thousand excellent questions because we're trying to figure out how this fits. And oftentimes what I've discovered with me is I'm trying to figure out how what God says fits into my old way of thinking instead of allowing God to wreck me and replace my old operating system with a brand new operating system. So it's both understandable and okay to struggle with this. I've talked to a couple people this week who have very good questions about how all of this fits and how does this work in the context of marriage and parenting and business and all of those things. Great questions. Excellent questions, but before we begin to answer some of those questions, we have to be clear on the fact that most of our questions arise out of an old operating system that God promises to replace. And so that's the hope, that's the goal, and what we see here in this famous story is Jesus replacing an old operating system in both the crowd and in Zacchaeus. So two things I want to look at briefly this morning. One, Christ's extension of undeserved grace, which we see in verses 1 through 7. And then two, our expression of spontaneous obedience, which we see in verses 8 through 10. Christ's extension of of undeserved grace, and then our expression of spontaneous obedience. This is such a well-outlined story in the Bible. It was so easy when I first looked at this passage to see the outline for this particular sermon because it's so neatly and tightly packed. What we have here in this story is an extension of grace unmeasured and undeserved, an extension of grace undomesticated and messy to someone who did not deserve it. And then we see the effect that the extension of God's grace has in our lives. And so we can look at Zacchaeus' response to God's amazing grace, and we can evaluate how well we are getting it, so to speak. But first, we need to look at the first seven verses, Christ's extension of undeserved grace. And we have to really picture the scene here, okay? And Jesus is making his way into Jericho, and he is mobbed. He had become famous for his healing ministry and his teaching ministry. He was saying things and doing things that nobody had ever said and done. And as a result, he had become famous. So as word spread that he was coming their way, the citizens of Jericho rushed out to see him. And we see in verse 2 and verse 3, particularly, a description of a man who also wanted to see Jesus. And he made his way toward the mob, but the verses tell us that because he was short, he couldn't see Jesus, and so he climbed a tree. Okay. Now, Verse 2 tells us something about this man. Tells us his name, obviously Zacchaeus, but it also tells us what he did. He was a chief tax collector, and it also tells us the result of his work. He was rich. So it gives us his name, Zacchaeus. gives us his occupation. It gives us his lifestyle. He, his name was Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. We're going to unpack that in a second. And he was rich. Now, to get the full weight of who this man was, you have to know something about tax collectors in those days. I grew up going to church, and I knew that tax collectors in the Bible days were people who weren't liked. I knew that. But I decided this week to really go back and look at why 
tax collectors were hated so much. And I've discovered some pretty interesting things. Um, the tax collector, first of all, represented the abuse of power of Rome. During the Roman Empire, which was in many ways an abusive reign, tax collectors were employed by the Roman Empire to go out and make money, to go out and seize assets for the sake of the spreading empire. And so nobody really liked the Roman Empire. They were afraid of the Roman Empire. They felt like they had to submit or die to the reign and rule of the emperor. And so a tax collector being an extension, a local extension of the abusive Roman Empire meant that these people weren't automatically welcomed into homes for dinner at night. Okay, they weren't the most popular people in town. And if you were a Jew, okay, you need to understand this. If you were a Jew, the tax itself, forget the tax collector for a moment. If you were a Jew, the tax itself was looked on as an inherent religious wrong and the payment of tax was considered an act of disloyalty to God, which, as you remember, the Pharisees tried to use against Jesus in the temple courts by tricking him. They said, you know, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Because back in those days, it was considered disloyalty to God to pay taxes to the state. And so, of course, you remember Jesus' answer. He says, give me a coin whose face is on it. Caesar's will render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and to God that which is God's. One of the only political statements actually Jesus makes in the entire in all the Gospels. But I mean, the Jews understood back in that day, or they thought they concluded back in that day, that paying tax itself uh, was an act of disloyalty to God. And if the tax collector himself was a Jew, <laughs> it made matters worse. It was like a double whammy. Okay, because they were seen by their fellow Jews as traitors. How could you align yourself with the abusive Roman Empire and demand that we exercise disloyalty to our God by paying taxes? I mean, they were seen as Benedict Arnold's. They were seen as full-on traitors. And then, to make matters even worse, they would always take more than what was owed so that they themselves could pad their pockets. So these guys were basically socially approved, politically approved thieves. That's what they were. Okay, And there was nothing anybody could really do about it because they had the weight of the Roman Empire behind them. And what's interesting as I went back and looked is that the tax rates back then were so vague and so indefinite. So the tax collector was always under the suspicion of being an extortioner. I mean, he made his money by collecting more than what was owed and keeping it for himself. So you look at this unusual combination in the tax collector of being a tyrant a traitor and a thief, and that in and of itself was not conducive to social popularity, okay? I mean, these, these guys were hated. And it also says that Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector, which meant that like a mob boss, he was the head honcho of all the tax collectors, okay? I mean, he was the thief of all the thieves. He was the chief. So it was one thing to take out your frustration and your anger on the person who came looking for money, but ultimately they knew that the buck stopped with Zacchaeus who would send these people out. And chief tax collectors were not even well liked by their fellow tax collectors that worked underneath them because they took a cut of what the other tax collectors went out to collect. Okay, I mean, this guy was hated. It, it reminds me of the story, maybe you've heard me tell it, of the two brothers. They were living in a 
small village, and they were known for their thefty ways. They were scandalous, and they were shrewd, and they ripped everybody off in the village. And all of a sudden, one of them dies, drops dead. And the living brother goes to the priest in the village and says, I'm sure you've heard by now that my brother is dead. Would you be so kind as to eulogize him? And the priest said, there's no way I'm going to eulogize your brother. Everybody in town is glad that he's dead. And he said, the living brother said, listen, I'll make it worth your while. And he offered him an exorbitant amount of money. And the priest said, well, for that amount, I think I can eulogize your brother. And the living brother said to the priest, there's only one condition that somewhere, somehow, in the context of your eulogy, you refer to my deceased brother as a saint. So the priest said, for that amount of money, I'll do whatever. So the day of the funeral comes, the whole town gathers. The whole town, because they wanted to make sure this guy was in fact dead. And so the priest begins his eulogy and he says, uh, every single person here knows the character of the man who lay here in this coffin. He was a swindler, he was a cheater, he was a stealer, and he ripped off everybody in this room, but compared to his brother, he was a saint. Okay, now, that's the way this town, that's the way this town felt about Zacchaeus. They hated him. They would have been happy had he died, had he dropped dead. And Jesus, making his way through, sees Zacchaeus, singles him out, calls him down, and announces, notice, that he must stay at his house. He doesn't say, I want to stay at your house, or would you be so kind to invite me over to your house? He says, I must stay at your house. And what commentators believe is that Jesus is making a profound statement about this encounter being central to Christ's mission. In other words, Jesus is making a statement about the centrality of his mission by inviting himself to Zacchaeus' house. And in essence, he was saying, this is what I'm all about. What I am doing here in this moment is the reason I came. Okay, I must stay at your house. So he identifies this hated man, singles him out, calls him down, says he must go to his house. Zacchaeus, of course, is thrilled. But as you can imagine, verse 7, the people are absolutely scandalized. Scandalized. I mean, of all the people Jesus decides to associate with, he chooses the most hated man in the city. It's no wonder that to many, Jesus was so unbearably frustrating, okay? This just doesn't make sense. Now, it's easy for you and me to look back on a famous Bible story and see just how pharisaical this crowd was, to see just how self-righteous this crowd was, it's very easy to look at this famous story, this familiar story, and say, wow, I can't believe it. Jesus is nice, uh, and these people are so mean. They just didn't get it. Well, replace, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago when I was talking about the ten lepers, I mean, replace this situation with a contemporary situation, okay, where grace and mercy is extended to the person who least deserves it. It's frustrating, doesn't this in some way, shape, or form, violate our deepest sensitivities when it comes to justice and fairness and all of this stuff. This is what's going on here. The crowd is absolutely scandalized. I mean, Jesus' popularity and public approval rating dropped significantly with this move. 
if his public approval rating and popularity was what was most important to Jesus, then he would have he would have shunned him and called him out publicly for his devious ways. And if he would have done that, Jesus' following would have tripled. These people would have been thinking to themselves, oh, this is it, finally. Our knight in shining armor has arrived to call out the thieves and the robbers and the liars. You know, take them, take them to the gallows. And instead of that, Jesus himself, I mean, think about this, he would have gained the respect and loyalty of the mob had he simply done away with this thief. They all hated his guts if Jesus would have called them out and said, away with you for your thefty ways and away with you for your idolatry of money and all of those things. I mean, the crowd would have cheered, cheered. Instead, Jesus, it's almost like he just wants to stir the pot. You know, grace does that. And Jesus sees him and says, I want to go to your house. Okay? In fact, I must go to your house. And by associating with him, Jesus himself becomes the object of scorn and ridicule. Now that, that is a preview, is it not? Of what he goes to the cross to do. Why is this episode, this account, so central to the mission of Jesus? Because the cross is central to the mission of Jesus. And this is a preview of what Jesus came to do. In other words, we are the Zacchaeuses in this story. We are the ones who are ill-deserving. We are the ones who don't deserve Christ's coming to us. We are the ones, and Jesus associates himself with us in the most profound and deepest way. He takes our sin upon his shoulders and gets the punishment and the wrath of God that we deserved. And he takes all of the righteousness that he earned by his perfect fulfillment of God's law and he deposits that into our account. That's what the word justification means. It not only means just as if I had never sinned, that's one side of the coin, it also means just as if I had always obeyed. That's the transaction, the exchange that... Jesus accomplishes, and we get a preview of that here because by associating with Zacchaeus, Jesus himself becomes the object of scorn and ridicule. Notice what happens. A shift takes place. The, the, the hatred, the frustration, and the anger of the mob gets redirected from Zacchaeus to Jesus. Now the scorn that was heaped on the shoulders of Zacchaeus is now heaped on the shoulders of Jesus. It's a remarkable preview, incredible picture, which is why commentators say this is central to the mission of Christ, this account. And like the Pharisee that I mentioned in Luke chapter 17, 17, I think, was that it? Of, uh... Was it yes, yes, no, seven, sorry, Luke seven. Prostitute, the Pharisee. Like the Pharisee in Luke seven, the crowd here assumes that God is for the clean and competent. They were they had a transactional, conditional operating system. You know, God helps those who help themselves. You know, sixty-eight percent of people inside the church believe that that's a verse in the Bible? 68%, okay? God helps those who, helps themsel who help themselves. That was, that's the operating system that this crowd had, that, that Pharisee in Luke chapter 7 had. It's conditional, it's transactional. You know, God, God blesses people who are good and God curses people who are bad. So the object of life is to become good. And as a result, the gospel becomes not Christ and Him crucified, but humanity and it improved. 
It's just another narcissistic self-help program. Okay, God, God provides the resources, but it's up to you to make sure you attain your best life now. Okay, that, 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 is, that is the old operating system at work. And just like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 7, this crowd was operating with that system, and they had come to the conclusion this wrecked them. This didn't make any sense to them, this entire encounter, because they were under the impression that God is for the clean and God is for the competent, that God is for the good and the righteous. But again, Jesus shows here that God is for the unclean and the incompetent and that when measured against God's perfect holiness, we're all unclean. We're all incompetent. By making this move, Jesus is saying once again with his actions, I came not to save the righteous, but the unrighteous. And every time he says that, he's not saying that there are some people who are righteous who don't need saving and other people who are unrighteous who do need saving. What he's saying is that all of us are unrighteous and all of us need saving. Some of us are aware of it and some of us aren't. And we saw the thing that blocks love for God when we looked at the account of the Pharisee and the prostitute in week one of this series. The thing that blocks love for God is not so much our unrighteous badness, but our self-righteous goodness, which is why in the Bible we see all the time that, you know, it's the publican and the prostitute who ends up getting grace. It's the Pharisee who doesn't. Okay, it's always the unrighteous younger brother who gets it before the self-righteous older brother. Ever since the Garden of Eden, where what we set out to do was to attain our own right standing, our own righteousness. Ever since then, the goal of life has become attain righteousness. And if that becomes the goal of life, you don't need Jesus. Jesus came to do for you and for me and for sinners what we could never do for ourselves. And so what we discover here is that the thing that gets in the way of our love for God and our understanding and appreciation of His grace is this old operating system that has somehow, some way concluded that not only does God help those who help themselves, but He's a clean-cut guy who drafts clean-cut guys. Okay? I mean, God doesn't, God doesn't select His team the way NFL teams select theirs in the April draft. I mean, He doesn't do that. In fact, Paul says just the opposite. God chooses the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chooses the weak things of this world to shame the strong. In other words, God's glorious grace is put on display when he singles out someone hated and socially despised like Zacchaeus. Where would grace be seen most colorfully? If Jesus picks out the guy in town who is most well-liked, everybody would have expected that, you know? Everybody would have expected that. Jesus selects the mayor that was voted in you know, with 98% of the popular vote. Everybody would have expected that. Jesus comes to town, you know, goes to the good, clean-cut guy. He doesn't. He does just the opposite. And by doing so, his grace is put on colorful, grand display, and the crowd hated it. And so we see this remarkable extension of God's grace. It, it, it takes deep awareness of our radical sin to comprehend His radical grace. You know why most of us struggle with God's radical grace? I'll tell you why I struggle with it. Because we might give lip service to the idea that we're pretty bad, but most of us don't think we are. Because of our old operating system that's very conditional and transactional, we have a strong tendency to look out at the really bad people out there and measure ourselves against them and say, I'm actually pretty good. And as a result, we struggle with grace. Bad people don't struggle with grace. Good people do. 
people who think they're good. Okay? They struggle with it. Bad people thank God for it. You know, the mark of spiritual growth is to be able to say what the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life. Planted churches, he had planted churches, he had preached, he had been imprisoned for his love and zeal for God. I mean, the guy was super saint, super saint Apostle Paul. And at the end of his life, the end of his life, with acute self-awareness, he says, I'm the worst guy that I know. You know, it's, there's this great story about this old Lutheran pastor who was on his deathbed and voiced confidence that he would go to heaven because he could never remember having ever done a good work. Now, that's defining good works in terms of works that we think might impress God in order to bless us. That's what he was meaning. But the fact of the matter is the, the, the good people, the people who think they're good don't get it. And this is why the old operating system has to be replaced. You don't add grace or try to fit grace on top of an old operating system. The whole thing has to be removed. The engine has to be taken out, not tweaked, and a brand new engine put in. And that's why I said last week, my goal each week is to um, give you a new set of glasses so that you can view everything differently, not just some things differently, everything. And then use the gospel each and every week to just polish the glasses because they get foggy and scratched during the course of the week. The gospel is the wind in our sails that keeps us going. But if we try to simply add it as a program, a newly installed program on the old operating system, we'll try to make sense of it according to our conditional categories, and it won't make sense. And what ends up happening is we say, this program just doesn't work. Conditionality works, unconditionality doesn't. So, Jesus here wrecks the crowd's categories with his grace, and he turns everything that makes sense in their conditional world upside down. So we see this remarkable extension of undeserved grace in verses 1 to 7. Um, but then we see something, and this is my favorite part of the story. We see Zacchaeus' expression of spontaneous obedience. I mean, Christ's extension of grace changes Zacchaeus. This is so important here this part of the story. Now that he has Zacchaeus in private, you'd expect him to say, now Zacchaeus, listen to me, okay? I didn't want to embarrass you out there, but now that I've got you in the privacy of your own home, listen, you are a bad guy, okay? I mean, you are. I mean, you, you spend your life stealing, ripping people off. You don't care that everybody hates you. Maybe you do, but you don't seem like you do. Um, you are out for you and you alone. Notice, Jesus doesn't say anything like that. Jesus said enough to create faith and repentance when he said, I must go to your house. Okay, When he singled them out and said, I must go to your house. And he extended undeserved, unpopular grace to this social outcast. Jesus doesn't, what's so fascinating here is Jesus doesn't require anything of Zacchaeus, but he gets a lot of obedience from him. Okay, parents, pay attention now. Jesus doesn't force him, coerce him, or guilt him into giving back what he stole. Zacchaeus does it spontaneously, joyously, from the heart, with great hilarity. I love that scene in Campus Crusade for Christ's Jesus film, if you've ever seen it. I, I saw it when I was a kid, and this scene where Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, and uh, Jesus doesn't say anything. Just the presence of Christ and his extension of undeserved grace so grips the heart of Zacchaeus 
that he jumps up from the table, sort of dances around the room. He's a short guy in his safe, which is basically behind this rock in his house. He has to stand up on some little platform thing. And he goes behind the rock and he grabs all of the money in there and he makes this declaration that he's going to pay back everybody he ripped off and he throws his money all around the room. It didn't matter to him anymore. And the whole house is just filled with song and joy and hilarity and laughter. It's a dance. That's the kind of grace, that's the kind of obedience that grace inspires. You know, um, I, I brought this up a couple, a couple weeks ago. I brought up Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, and I showed how Paul made the strong point in those verses that disobedience and lawlessness happen not when we think too much of grace, but when we think too little of grace. Because there is this common misunderstanding inside the church even that grace and obedience don't go hand in hand, that they're enemies. To ensure obedience, we need the law. And that's not what's going on here, <laughs> okay? I mean, I've said this before, but grace truly understood leads to heartfelt obedience, not disobedience. Where disobedience is happening, it's not grace's fault. It's our failure to grasp it. Because what we see here is when grace is grasped, it leads, it compels obedience, not begrudging obedience either. Joyous, spontaneous obedience. It's the kind of obedience, it's the kind of good works that are similar to, and I've used this illustration before, if you're a parent and you're teaching your four or five year old to ride a bike and um, he or she is making his way down the road and they fall over and they scrape their knee and they chip their tooth and they're hurting and they're bleeding, you don't stop as a parent and say, now what should I do here? Um, maybe he should just bleed a little bit more. Maybe she should just endure the pain. I'm teaching her to be tough. I'm, you don't, what do you do? Instinctively, spontaneously, you run to help. You run to help. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to philosophize about it. You don't have to theologize about it. You don't have to weigh the pros and the cons. You don't spend unnecessary time dissecting what needs to be done. Your heart responds and you run because of your love for your child. That's the kind of spontaneous, instinctive, hilarious obedience that love for God summons from us. And that's what we see so remarkably in this story, that the story demonstrates supremely that it's the unconditional grace and kindness of the Lord that ultimately leads to repentance and change. Doesn't Paul say that in Romans? It's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. When I think back, when I think back to when God saved me at 21 years old, and I had been living just a heinous, raucous lifestyle from the time I was 14, 15 to the time I was 21. And I've told you before, my parents kicked me out of the house and I dropped out of high school and I was living every young guy's dream. No parents breathing down my neck and teachers looking over my shoulder and I could finally pursue pleasure with all of my might. And God brought me to the end of myself at 21 years old and He raised me from death to life and I've never been the same. But when I think back to that time when God rescued me and saved me and opened my eyes and helped me to see my need for Christ's finished work, I think back now and I think, what was it during that season of my life that made God singularly attractive to me? I know that God saved me and that God drew me to himself. But from a human standpoint, what was it about God that was so attractive to me that made me want to go run to him? It was my reflection on his forbearance. 
His kindness, His gentleness, and His unconditional forgiveness. I mean, I just could not believe that someone who had messed up as much as me would still matter to God. I couldn't believe it. And it was that display of unconditional, otherworldly kindness that made me run to Him and say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. And yet, for some reason, I think while that worked with me, and God, in, God disciplines those He loves, Hebrews tells us, and that means that because He loves us, our sin enslaves us, even after God saves us, our sin enslaves us, and God, Jesus, came to set us free, and so in love He disciplines us so that we might once again taste and experience the freedom that He purchased for us so dearly. So this isn't without discipline. It's not grace versus discipline, okay? But what is it about me as a parent, for instance, that thinks that worked with my, my, my spontaneous, instinctive response to God out of love because He first loved me? We love Him how? Because He first loved us. That worked with God and me, but that's not what we're going to do in this house, Okay? I mean, it's unbelievable to me. We're scared to death of it. I mean, we look at this according to the way a lot of us treat people around us when we want to ensure that they're going to be good, as if that's the goal. But the way we treat people around us would be to say, Jesus, mess up here, okay? I mean, you put you or me in the place of Jesus here, and we would, I mean, we would sit down and have a little conversation with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus didn't need to be told the extension of God's grace of Christ singling him out with a smile on his face and calling him down and going to his house. Zacchaeus, that blew his mind and it opened his eyes. And he saw his sin and he saw his Savior waiting with open arms. That's what he saw. That's the power of grace. Okay. Every teacher and parent knows that external compliance without heart change is shallow and short-lived. What brings great joy, for instance, to me as a father when two of my children, for instance, get into a fight, an argument, whatever, and I separate them, and after a while, I call him downstairs and I say, you say sorry to him. You say sorry to him. And then they look at each other and they say, sorry. In that moment, am I going, thank you, Jesus. My children's hearts have been gripped by your unconditional, radical grace and their love for one another has compelled them to apologize. No, I am moderately satisfied in that moment because at the very least they've done what I've told them to do. But no actual heart change has taken place. Now, how much more delighted am I, and this has happened too, when two of them get into a fight, argument, whatever, and I separate them, and without me having to say even a word, one comes out to the other and says, with tears in his or her eyes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love you, and what I said to you and what I have done to you um, doesn't demonstrate love, and, and I apologize. Now, what's my father heart doing in that moment? I'm rejoicing, celebrating. The law can ensure external compliance. And if that's what you want for your children and those in your life, that's fine. God wants more. Now, I'm going to show here in just a second that it doesn't mean rules and regulations are unnecessary. They maintain boundaries and they keep order. We've got plenty of them in our house, so that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that to depend on rules, regulations, law, to reach down inside a human heart and change it is something that the Bible says can't happen. The law guides us, according to the Bible, and it's a reliable guide, but only the gospel 
of God's free grace gives us the power to do what it says. It's like depending on the railroad tracks instead of the engine in the train to make the train go. It doesn't work. And so, God is not, as you've heard me say before, God is not, and this may come as a surprise to you, God is not concerned with any kind of obedience. He's concerned with a certain kind of obedience. Corinthians tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Paul exhorts the Corinthian church not to give begrudgingly. The sacrifices of Cain and Abel are a perfect Old Testament example of this. Both Cain and Abel, from an external standpoint, complied. And yet, one of the sacrifices was rejected and the other was received. Why? Cain was giving begrudgingly because he had to. Abel was giving joyfully because he got to. If external compliance was the measure, then the Pharisees should be the highest standard that all of us are trying to achieve. Because they externally complied better than anybody else in the Bible. And Jesus says, on the outside you are clean as a whistle, but on the inside you are dead. Whitewashed tombs. Brood of vipers, he called them, because the goal of life was external compliance. And when the goal of life becomes external compliance, or the goal of parenting becomes external compliance, or the goal of marriage becomes external compliance, or whatever, one of two things happens, and I've mentioned this before. When we are having good days and we're doing well, we are so proud. When we have bad days and we're not doing well, we despair. See, the gospel of God's grace which replaces the old operating system, protects us from both of those extremes and keeps us centered in the ocean of grace, which is what Jesus is doing here. Obedience that is spontaneous, instinctive, and marked with hilarity only happens as hearts are gripped by unconditional grace. What motivates our obedience, listen carefully, What motivates, this is the operative word, motivation, what motivates our obedience determines whether or not it's a sacrifice of praise. Um, I love this illustration I heard years ago. Years ago when I was in college, John Piper came to preach at the school where I was going in South Carolina, and he gave this illustration at the end of his first talk. He said, imagine this scene. It's my wife's It's our anniversary, and I come home after a long day at the office, and I have a bouquet of flowers behind my back, and I go to the front door of my house, and I ring the doorbell, and Noel, which is his wife's name, comes to the door, somewhat, you know, perplexed because it's his house. Why is is he ringing the doorbell? But she opens the door, and he's standing there, and he says, happy takes the flowers from behind his back and says, happy anniversary, Noel. And she says, oh, John, why did you? And he says, it was my duty. Okay. I've read the books. I've gone to the self-help religious section of Barnes and Nobles. I've read everything that Jim Dobson tells me I need to do. And it says on your anniversary, bring flowers to your wife, doing my duty. He said, now how's she going to respond? She's going to slam the door in his face, okay? That kind of obedience doesn't glorify his wife. Now, fast forward, or, you know, turn it around. Same thing, comes home, flowers behind his back, rings the doorbell. She answers the door, somewhat perplexed. Oh, Johnny, they're beautiful. Why did you? I couldn't help myself. I mean, I, I could not help myself. I... My, I love you because I love you. And I've arranged for a babysitter to come tonight because there's nothing I'd rather do than for you and I to spend the evening alone together. Now, is she going to respond by saying, you are so selfish. Listen to what you just said, okay? Um, there's nothing I'd rather do than to spend the evening with... She's not going to say that. She's going to melt 
What form of obedience glorified his wife? The, I'm doing my duty because this is what the books told me to do? Or, I can't help myself. Parents, listen to me, okay? <laughs> this is gonna, I'm with you. I'm in the trenches, okay? I'm with you. I've told you this before. I'm not sitting in some, you know, lighthouse shouting down. I'm on the beaches and I'm bleeding, all right? So listen to me. If your goal for your children is external compliance only, you are not loving them. Listen, my parents gave me grace, thank God, and it came in various forms. One was, you're out of the house. <laughs> Best thing they could have done for me. They did it with tears. My mother and father did it with tears streaming down their face. It's amazing how we talk about tough love, tough love, tough love, and what we're really saying is the banner of tough love gives us the ability to be a jerk. Okay, no, I, whenever I hear tough love, I say, does the person that you're exercising tough love with feel your toughness or your tenderness more? My dad spanked us, my dad kicked me out of the house, my dad did, but he did it with tears. Okay, so I'm all for tough love in that sense. But my parents gave me grace, and you know what? Uh, there are, there, if people would have evaluated my parents' strategy based on how I was doing at 16, 17, 18, year old, 18 years old, and they had friends who told them, you blew it. You should have been harder. You should have been stricter. You should have laid down the law even more. Now look at what you've done. Don't be premature in your evaluation. Yeah, I'm still a messed up kid, trust me. But it was that amazing display of God's grace. It was those seeds that were sown by my parents because they trusted God and His operating system more than their own that God used to sprout when I was 21 years old and He saved me. Okay, if it doesn't work tomorrow, so what? Who cares? We're, such, we're so pragmatic. It didn't work. You don't know. There were two people, my parents had two friends, who sat me down. Two men, when I was 16 years old. One of them sat me down and said, you're blowing it, okay? You're a selfish brat. There's six other kids in your household, and you're making the whole house revolve around you. What's wrong with you? And what is the matter with you? And I sat there, and I listened. He was bigger than me, okay? So I just sat there, and I, we're sitting in Burger King, Coral Springs. I sat there, and I listened. Mm-hmm, Okay. And in my heart, I could not wait to get away from that guy. He did not do anything that made me want to go home and say I'm sorry to my mom and dad. About a year later, another guy sat me down, a guy that's still a friend today. And he said, you know I love your mom and dad, and you know I love you. And I don't know what God's doing, but I know God loves you too. And he said, um, if, if you ever need anything, I'm here. Here's my phone number. You call me. I, I, you have my word that I will pray for you every single day. That was it. It made me want to jump up from the table, fall on my face before my mom and dad and say, I'm sorry. Okay? One is what the law does. Paul says it stirs up all sorts of rebellion and ungodliness. The other is what grace does. Um, the path to obedience is through the grace of the gospel because only undeserved grace can truly melt and transform the heart. That's really the goal, and that's what we see here. And as I said, rules aren't bad, okay? They help establish order and necessary boundaries, but rules themselves have no power to change the human heart. And the fact is, and this is the great illustration of the story, the fact is that the only way licentious people start to obey is when they get a taste of God's radical, unconditional acceptance of sinners. You want your kids to obey. God wants your kids to obey. No one's disagreeing with that. It's what, how do we get them there? What's going to get them there? This Charles Spurgeon put his finger on what gets, on what gets them there. He said, when I thought God was hard, 
I found it easy to sin. But when I found God so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion, I smote upon my breast to think that I could ever have rebelled against one who loved me so and sought my good. Let me just conclude with this. I could preach for another hour, but I won't, okay? Um, This is so important, so important, and so practical. Um, I was listening to a sermon a while back that Steve Brown, who was my preaching professor in seminary, uh, Steve Brown was preaching, and he tells this story, gives this anecdote of this uh, teacher of his when he was in high school. And he says, I wasn't a good student. Uh, I didn't care about school. I didn't care about my teachers. And one day, after we had taken a test and the teacher had given back all the tests, he said, she didn't give mine back. And she said to me, I, I want to see you after school. I mean, after class. And Steve said, oh my gosh, I am in big, big trouble now. And when all the other students left, he went up to her desk and she handed him his test and it was a big fat F. And she just started weeping. And the only words that came out of her mouth was, I love you and I know you can do better than this. And she was crying so uncontrollably she had to leave the room. Steve said he made straight A's in her class from that point forward. He never failed another test. Why? What was his motivation? Because a teacher loved him enough to shed tears over his sin, over his failure. That's what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus shedding tears over our sin and our rebellion and all of our messed upness. And it is through those tears that amazing grace floods our, our hearts and compels love and obedience. Compels it. And the good news is that while it compels obedience, we're still sinners until we die or Jesus comes back. We still have sin mixed in there, even with the good things that we do. But when we fail... Because of Christ's work, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that reestablishes our love for Him again because we know we deserve condemnation. I've done this ten times and I deserve condemnation. And Jesus says, I've taken care of it. It is finished. And that it is finished declaration again compels more love and more obedience. It is Christ and Christ alone that can do for you and me what we could never do for ourselves. So meditate on this story. Look at the details of it. It's a remarkable picture of how grace works 